Welcome everybody. We're actually standing out in the shed. This thing had tools in it just a few weeks ago. We've recently converted it over to an office oasis for Elena because she's working from home these days. So if you want to see the conversion process, stick around. It's very different, so I implore you to <laughs> take a look at what it's become. Elena, what do we have out here? So this is my work from home office while I work from home. We're also a place where I can maybe do some reading and just some quiet time. My daughter likes coming in here too, so it's just kind of a little getting out of the house. What did this look like when we first started? Uh, it was all just OSB and tools. I mean, this this had everything mm -hmm. in it. Just yeah, it was dark. There were no windows, so it mm -hmm. was it was a shed. Yep. It's plain and simple. <laughs> now this is an insulated shed, and this is dense pack cellulose insulation. I just took off the sheet of plywood, and you can see the cellulose hasn't settled. It's still right up at the very top. Still looks good, it's still hard. This is what a proper dense pack should be. Now a little background, this building was insulated to start with, and that was because I built this as a joint venture with an insulation company. We were testing their product and we had sensors in here and how much energy it was using. And it, it was a fun project. We had done blower doors uh, on the shed, <laughs> but it was a test hut for the insulation. Uh, once that project was done, after the first year of monitoring, we took out the sensors. Ever since then, it's just been a tool shed. Until now. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first thing we had to do? Uh, well, we had to take everything out. Mm -hmm. So shout out to my dad for helping to do that. Um, there was a lot of stuff in here. Um, move stuff away from the shed because we put in two new windows. Yep. So we had to cut holes in the beautiful insulation. <laughs> I know, I had to remove it. I'm cutting out this portion of the wall for a window and here's the cellulose with no netting. I'm taking this netting down, this is called InsulWeb, and it's just there to hold the cellulose in place. Now you can see it's still there, it's not glued or anything. The cellulose completely conforms to your stud bay. That's a proper dense pack. So now I'm going to take this netting down and I need to carve all this out and cut out the stud and then bring it out to the exterior wall. The neat thing about removing the insulation, we got to check if it was still holding up and whether or not the dense pack was still good. And it was. We were able to cut the hole in the walls and the cellulose didn't fall down on its own. It actually stayed in position uh, and that is an indication of how well it was dense packed. Now, in addition to that, we had done several testing and verification during the process of insulating it. So we knew that, but it was just fun to go back uh, several years later. I think this shed has been here about six years and just double check that everything was great and there was no rotting anywhere, <laughs> uh, no mold. It just, it looked really good when we took that insulation out and were able to inspect the framing and the sheathing. Light is fading, but I got the opening cut so this is rough cut. Now what I need to do, see where I cut the stud right off? I need to add blocking in here. So I'm gonna jam a two by four in here and screw it to the sheathing. And then toenail it to this stud. I have to add blocking up on the back side of this piece, all the way up to the ceiling, and then block the top across. I finished framing out this window. So you can see the new cripple studs and header I added over here. So quite a bit of new lumber. This uh, older discolored lumber was actually from the old garage that I took down. Uh, it's kind of neat that I still had a couple pieces kicking around. I saved that lumber and have been using it over the years for different projects. So you see some of it's just little blocks, I didn't go all the way down with it, because this interior wall is non-structural. This stud was existing, then I added a little block here. So more than enough framing for what I need in this little shed. There's one part of this that didn't line up, and that is this stud right here is actually bowing, or coming in at least, 
down here. So when I go and I add the plywood piece that's going to be from this point in, I'm going to have to shim this side of it. It'll nail flat here and then I'll have to shim this and bring it out. So that shouldn't be too big of a deal. The other ones, I think I got lined up really well with the outside, see that? So I won't have to shim them. I went through and cleaned up some of these edges with the Sawzall so that it will sit flatter. Uh, you don't want to bump in the sheathing. So I'm installing that window out there in the shed. So I came over here to look at the different uh, flashing tapes that I have. So this is a um, flex, flexible one from Tyvek. And this is two years old. And then I reached back and I found this one. This is the same exact material, just in a different width. But this one is six years old. And look at that, the, uh, the tar bitumous material is actually soaking through the Tyvek face. And then if I go and I pull this, look at that, it's actually coming apart. And it's been sitting here on a shelf inside a conditioned space. So I, I guess I don't recommend these anymore. These are, uh, here we go, DuPont makes Tyvek flex wrap. So don't get that. Uh, this is probably what I'll go grab right now, the all-weather flashing tape. So this is 3M all-weather flashing tape. 3M always seems to use a paper backing <laughs> instead of uh, like plastic. I forgot my little things in the corner. <laughs> I was supposed to put those on first. Uh, so after we installed the windows, then what did we do? Um, we then, we put down the radiant um, tubing on the floor. And it should be noted that within this process, obviously you had to put the electrical in. Yeah. So you had to wire it up. So I wired the entire shed using 12 gauge wire. Now this is good up to 20 amps. The reason that I did that is because I'm actually connecting this shed just with an extension cord over to the garage right now. All of the outlets in the garage have 20 amp circuit breakers. So I wanted to make sure that I was matching that. Here on this side, towards the door, I removed these two panels because I was cutting that out. It's gonna be a light switch, a thermostat, and then the bottommost one, which is gonna go down here in this corner, that's gonna go through the wall and I'm gonna put a conduit in with a junction box on the outside. I took out this piece of sheathing and I marked out where all these need to go and cutting them out so that they can drop in. The way I'm doing this is I'm starting out with a one inch diameter hole and then I'm using a quarter inch spiral upcut bit. It's on the circle template because that's how I cut out the ceiling for the round circle electrical boxes and I'm just going through freehand and I'm finding this actually faster than using my jigsaw which is how I started this. After all these holes are cut in, next step I'm going to remove this panel and I'm going to remove this panel with that outlet in it because I need to run a wire from the main point, which is going to be here, around to this box, then up through the top plate and over to that junction box. I strap the ceiling by cutting strips of plywood. It's not necessarily the fastest or easiest way to do that. It was just how I decided to do it because I was dense packing. So I put the netting up first, then I put the strapping on, then I dense pack the ceiling. Now to get it through the top plate, uh, there's an outlet down here at the base. So I'm coming up from where the outlet is and we're gonna drill this. So I'm using this really long bit and 
I'm gonna I'm gonna go in at least an inch and a half into that top plate get it started over on this side I have the wire now in that hole that I drilled and I can reach up here with my hand over to that and then feel where that wire is there we go so I can get that wire through and now I'll be running this wire up over the strapping and across and down to this outlet. I'm done with the electrical. Down here I tuck that wire in. Now that's one outlet and it jumps up and then comes across. What I did was I tucked it in over there so that when I screw this piece of plywood back up to the ceiling, there's no chance I'm gonna hit it. So then it jumps down comes over here. So it's just a big jumper wire that goes up and over the ceiling and connects one outlet to the other. And then that outlet's getting powered from over here. So right here I have three wires all coming down to this corner. That's gonna be the main junction. And then this one comes up to the thermostat and that's gonna be a line voltage thermostat that then will jump back down for the radiant floor. We're inside the shed and we're finally ready for the part of the project that I'm really excited about. We're going to install an electric radiant floor. It's 60 square feet and it should draw 720 watts when it's running. It's a 120 volt unit. So inside here should be the mat for it. Now before I can put down the mat, I have to prep the floor. For the last two days, I've been running a space heater out here in the garage uh, and the floor is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. My goal was just to get it above freezing because it has been so cold the past week. The floor in here prior to running the heater was about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to be pouring a self-leveling compound over this, which uses water, and I didn't want the water to freeze in the process of installing this. Uh, I need to do a little bit of prep work. I have this old blue tape on the floor and that was part of the original experiment projects with this shed of checking for air tightness at different stages. So I'm just gonna cut any of this that is loose, like peeling up. I'm gonna do a final vacuum. I need to put a curb at the threshold so that the self leveling compound doesn't fall out. Uh, and then we're gonna get this down. So right before we put down the electric radiant floor, I painted the floor with a primer and so this primer is recommended for the self-leveling compound. Let's get the prime in. Just shake this up first. And I read the instructions and it said when you're going over plywood, uh, you don't need to dilute this. So I'll just use it full strength. And we now have a purple floor. All right, cool. We'll just let that heater run in the windowsill and should be good. It's the next day and this purple primer has dried and cured. It's not sticky anymore. So we're gonna do a couple more prep things and then get the electric mat down. We're gonna put down this sill seal and it's uh, pretty common stuff. It's just a thin roll of foam and I'm gonna staple it around the perimeter and that will just provide a break. So hopefully that helps uh, a little bit with maybe splash and keeping the stuff from binding to the walls because in case I want to take down a wall panel I don't want the floor uh, kind of glued to it. The The flooring is an electric radiant floor kit that I purchased from Amazon. There will be a link in the description below to the kit that I used but you select the size that you want based on the square footage. Uh, so it is held away from the walls about six inches all the way around the perimeter. Uh, the outside of this building is 10 by 12. The inside of the building is eight by 10. Uh, so uh, we have one foot thick walls uh, and the ceiling is fully insulated and the floor is fully insulated. It's dense pack cellulose all the way around 360. Then we installed the electric radiant floor, which the kit came with instructions and it was really easy. So Elena gets to set it to whatever temperature she wants. It's a little warm for me. <laughs> now, when I read the instructions for this, it said that this style with the wire on the mat is good for like a rectangle, a basic shape, which is what we have here. They also make it without the uh, mat where you, you hook it on each side and those are good for oddly shaped buildings or rooms. The kit that I bought came with a few different things. We have the electric mat right here. We have a temperature sensor that 
I think this one goes in the floor. We have a thermostat, which is also going to read the air temperature of the room. And it also comes with a little monitor. So if the wire gets accidentally broken during installation, this alarm should go off. There's that little alarm. And I have all this right here close to this box because that's where the wire is gonna go up. It's gonna go up through here to the thermostat, which I've got. So I'm at the end of the run and I just cut it and flipped it. So right here, you can see that red wire is not broken, but I cut the mesh right there and I'm flipping it over. So it's serpentine patterns here and it did curve up, but now it's gonna go straight and come down this row. So I put down a ton of staples, <laughs> at least a dozen sticks of staples that I put down because staples are cheap and I don't want this floating. Uh, I marked out a little pink line. Now that's not a level line, that's just showing me the thickness. So that's a half inch thickness line. So I wanna make sure that it's at least half an inch thick everywhere. And then we put down self leveling to try it because who knows what may have settled throughout the years. So we tried to level this out and then we put up the paneling because- oh, Hang on, let me put, share some more details before we get to that part. Okay. Then the self-leveling compound. And we had a little bit of a hiccup there, uh, my own fault. Uh, what, what happened with the self-leveling compound? Seven buckets all with five quarts of water, seven bags opened, ready to go. I have a spare battery for the drill if that one dies. <laughs> I think I've done all the prep work possible because as soon as we add this to the buckets, the timer is going. <laughs> so we got a little ahead of ourselves with mixing it and we did not move fast enough and a lot of things didn't mix together well enough. So the first bucket was perfect. <laughs> By the time we got to about the fourth, what we used to mix it was just not doing it. So we ended up having to kind of toss that and buy a new compound. So. But once we figured out what was wrong, we th they were like smooth as yogurt. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, this was a failure. Uh, the buckets, I couldn't mix them. So I was trying to use uh, this drill and I was just burning through the batteries super fast and I wasn't getting a good mix. So part of the problem I think was that I dumped them all in before we had the first one completely mixed. Yeah, it was about a $240 mistake for me. A learning curve that hopefully you don't make. <laughs> now using the right tool for the job, it's mixing this way better. So we rented a paddle mixer that's typically sold for like joint compound for drywall. And that allowed uh, enough torque and speed to mix all of them. Now I just thought that my uh, drill would have been fine. Uh, it's a DeWalt drill and it's served me well in the past, but it didn't have enough power to keep up with all this. The motor was getting hot and the batteries were burning through pretty quick, so. <laughs> so now that this one's mixed up a little bit, now I'll add to the second one. Went and rented that and it's not expensive to rent that tool uh, and it's not expensive to buy either if you're gonna do more than one of these. And so we mixed all the buckets before we poured the first one and then uh, Elena helped uh, bring them to the door and I was inside here and pouring out the self-leveling compound. <laughs> they were heavy. I was like, please don't break, please don't break. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, then I used a landscaping rake uh, simply because it was something that I had on hand uh, to help spread it out a little bit because it, even though it is self-leveling, it still needs a little bit of encouragement. <laughs> Go to that corner and level yourself up. <laughs> I've covered all the area. Uh, according to the formula on the bags, this should be enough. <laughs> so hopefully that levels and is okay. <laughs> it's been a few days since I installed the self-leveling compound, so it has cured and we are ready to move on to the next stage. It's below freezing outside right now. We have tons of snow on the ground. But the floor is, what temperature is the floor? Right How's now, it feel? oh, it's toasty. Right now it's saying 98. <laughs> so the floor temperature is 98, but. <laughs> the air it's... temperature is very comfortable, you know, enough yeah. to just wear a sweater. I think it's 76 degrees Fahrenheit out here right now. <laughs> I hooked up the thermostat in a very temporary fashion. It's right there. 
and I just plugged it in to watch this cord. And you can see it's drawing 650 watts. Do you remember what the next step was after we let that dry? So we put some plastic down or anything to cover the floor because I'm simply not just happy with painting it. I wanted to make it a little bit prettier if it was gonna <laughs> be my oasis. So um, we bought 11 sheets of beadboard mm -hmm. um, to put up. Cause I kind of wanted this cottagey feel to it. Now I have to go through and do some prep work and get ready to install some paneling on the ceiling and the walls. All around the perimeter, I put in this sill seal. So I'm gonna take my razor blade and come down here real close. And we gotta slice that off anywhere that like the the edge of the concrete is a little bit high. I might have to run a file along there. I just wanna make sure that uh, when I put down the laminate flooring that it doesn't lip up right at the edge. So I cut off the sill seal, that happened pretty easily. And now I'm going through and finding any of these staples that are proud. There we go. And then I'm also running this along and any high points of this uh, cement material I'm taking that down. Next I gotta take the wires and I'm gonna be tucking the wires up into the hole so when I put the paneling up, they're not in the way. The perimeter is all cleaned up and now I've unrolled and cut this piece of plastic. This is six mil black plastic, it's 10 feet wide. So I'm gonna unroll it and tape it along the perimeter using some blue painter's tape. I've now got the plastic down on the floor and taped around the perimeter. So I'm ready to start coming in and working on the paneling. I'm making all of my cuts on this piece of scrap two inch foam board. Uh, it's an insulation board, but it works really well as a backing for this kind of flimsy material uh, to make a good clean cut. Insulation makes everything better. Right before he put that up, he did cut for the lights. <laughs> so there is electricity in here, obviously. And he put in six lights, which is a bright. <laughs> well, we have the two on the back up and we have the uh, ceiling on and light fixtures cut out and things are not perfectly square in, in the building so we are getting a couple of spots like this but no worries I'll be able to fix that trim hides everything all of the paneling is in place uh, I had some screws in here because it was gluing to the corner that I put in I had to cut a piece back there and I've gone through and I've checked for any high nails and set them. And now it's time to caulk. I'm just using some dab and I'm putting a small bead down in there. And I'm very, very lightly putting some on there. Next, I'm just taking this kind of silicone caulk tool. This goes right in the corner and then I can drag it along. I finished painting inside and I think it came out pretty good. Now I just finished this wall. That wall I did last night, so if I need to touch anything up, I can. The lights are all LED and they are fixtures that can be installed in either a recessed can, or in this case, I installed four inch round junction boxes in the ceiling, and this is for old work. So I was fishing the wires through the insulation. Uh, I was mounting the recessed box up there and then it has a little wing that pops up, pops out to the side when you screw it in, and that holds the box in place. So that's all done just after the fact. <laughs> After we had the paneling installed, caulked, and painted, we finally got to move on to the floor. 
And when I pulled up the black plastic that I had laid down on the floor as a protection, uh, I noticed a little bit of dampness in the self-leveling compound. So we let it dry out a little bit longer, then we finally got to move on to the floor. Now for the really exciting part. We're ready to install the laminate flooring. Elena, what floor did you pick out? Uh, it is an eight inch wide oak laminate from uh, Lumber Liquidators. And it's just the perfect look. I wanted something, you know, woody, but nothing too, <laughs> uh, too dark, too light. It's kind of a good mix, but it's better than I, I could have imagined. Everything looks great together. We're gonna start with just this padding, uh, which is recommended for the laminate flooring. Now this has some insulating value and everything is better with insulation. Uh, in this case, it's just gonna help dampen any noise like hollow noise from walking on the floor. Uh, but this is very minimal compared to the huge amount of insulation that's underneath the floor. This is the first plank I'm gonna put down. It has a little bit of damage right here, but it's on the edge that's gonna get ripped off. So how much do we rip off to start with? The finished nice laminate surface is eight inches wide. The building is 92 and a half inches to the inside faces. So I'll leave a quarter inch. That means I have 92 inches of finished floor that I want down in the middle. Now that would be 11 and a half planks. Now if I did that at 11 and a half planks, that means then one side would be a full plank and the other side would be a half plank. So instead, I'll do three quarters of a plank over here and three quarters of a plank equally on the other side. That means I'm going to rip this one to six inches of finished surface. Then I'll have 10 rows that are all full and then I'll have a six inch row at the other side. So it'll be even all the way across. Today we're gonna to install the trim. So the last piece of trim to go right around the base, it's gonna hide the gap. Uh, which is necessary when you're putting down a floating floor, you need a gap between the wall and the floor. We're gonna hide that gap using simple quarter round. Now it's called that because it's one quarter of a circle. It's probably the cheapest, most basic thing you can get. So I'm gonna use a very minimal number of nails. Uh, I'll touch up the nail heads, uh, but I'll be gluing it in place to the wall not the floor, and that's important to still allow the movement of the floor for expansion and contraction. But I did pay a little extra for the pre-finished version. It's actually a PVC, not a wood. Uh, so that way, if it gets gouged or something, it still has white underneath. So there's no reason to paint it. Elena has only been out here full time for one week. So we've only been running the heater for one week in the electric radiant floor. In the past week, it's been using an average of 10 kilowatt hours per day to warm the space. The 10 kilowatt hours per day that we've been using so far has really been warming up everything, the mass of the structure. After we get to that point and start plateauing, uh, that per day kilowatt hour use should go down. And we just had a big snowstorm and there's no snow in here, so the windows <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> That's a good thing. Uh, so we have two windows in here. So that, uh, if you crack the windows, you can get a cross breeze. Uh, and how's that worked out? Very nice. Yeah, just crack the tops and the way it just insulation. The insulation in this is, is everything. So <laughs> insulation makes everything better. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've been below freezing the entire time that I've built the shed. So uh, quite often I was leaving space heaters out here at night uh, to try to warm things up because I didn't want to install uh, warm paneling on frozen walls. Uh, not, not that there's any ice in there, but just from an expansion contraction perspective. Ideally, all the building materials are the same temperature when you install them. Yeah, it looks perfect. I love it. And now I have a commute. <laughs> I can walk across the yard. <laughs> At all of these stages, our uh, two kids, uh, especially our daughter, she just loved running around in circles out here. So that was great. <laughs> So I might have to make another one of these just for her to play in. <laughs> <laughs> Other things I guess that are still on the to-do list, uh, I still have the siding off the wall where I had to install the window, but it's currently buried with over a foot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna have to uh, wait a little bit and probably in the springtime, I'll put that siding back up. And then just finish up the door. Our daughter painted the door for us. 
Uh, so. And obviously she can only go so high. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to do some kind of paneling or paint job or trim work on the door and cover up the tape <laughs> that's currently on it. Are there any improvements that we should do next time? Um, I can't really think of anything. I think this is just the perfect little room <laughs> for this size. If you were to go any bigger, obviously some of these things could be more labor intensive, but I think what we did for this size makes it homey and makes it, you know, as you mentioned, a an oasis. It's better than I could have imagined. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it's so bright! <laughs> Everyone should have one. <laughs> have your she shed. <laughs>